Okay, now that we've introduced regular group convolutions, uh, where I must admit that I haven't explained the regular part, but regular comes from the fact that we use the regular representation, of course, to transform the kernels. Uh, so, okay, so now that we've introduced regular group convolutions, we can build actual neural networks uh, with them. And we're going to do so in this video with the application to uh, histopathology. So the setting is as follows. So we want to build an architecture for rotation invariant mitotic cell detection. So we want to detect some, some type of abnormal cells. So given an input patch, we pull it through a neural network and it should spit out the label, oh, it's, a, it's a normal cell or it's a mitotic cell. And obviously uh, the prediction of the label should be invariant to rotations that we apply to this uh, input patch because, well, it's still the same cell if I rotate the image. And yeah, we're going to do that via group convolutional neural network. So we stick to this uh, recipe that we introduced in the previous uh, video. So we start off with an input image, then we apply a lifting convolution, which adds uh, an extra access to it, which encodes for, let's say, the pose under which a certain feature is detected. And then we apply group convolutions in which we can detect advanced patterns of, um, well, of features at relative positions and at relative rotations uh, to each other, where relative is all captured by this notion of, of the group product. Um, now, what is important to note here, we showed that all these layers like lifting convolution and group convolutions, one after we applied one after each other, um, uh, composes or constructs an equivariant mapping from input to output. So meaning if the input rotates, um, the same information stays in the network, it's just being picked up at different uh, locations along this extra axis in, in, uh, in the feature maps. So all this part of the neural network encodes for equivariant features. And since in the end we're uh, interested in um, well an invariant descriptor or an invariant classification, we can do a pooling over this axis and that generates an invariant uh, feature vector, um, which we can use then to classify the, the, well, uh, the patch. So generally such neural networks, they have like a sort of encoding or invariant feature extractor phase and a classification phase. And again, it's important to stress here, the problem is invariant, but we want to keep equivariant as much as possible because this allows us to uh, use weight sharing over all possible poses, but also to learn very intricate patterns of features at relative poses uh, relative to each other. Okay, and one thing I haven't mentioned actually is that after you do a lifting convolution, we can uh, use uh, pointwise non-linearities, right? Pointwise non linearities such as uh, ReLU or uh, something like that. And yeah, we are allowed to use such pointwise nonlinear. It doesn't break the equivalence properties just like uh, applying ReLUs on ConfNets uh, doesn't break the translation uh, equivalence. And another, and another thing worth mentioning is that um, you see in this diagram, the, the spatial axis of this, uh, these feature maps, they shrink, right? And that's because we don't use um, a padding in our convolutions and we do spatial pooling in between, right? So we are also allowed uh, to do that. And that leads to the fact that in the end, we've shrunk this patch to just a single pixel and all the orientations over here. And then we pull over this in order to obtain just a single feature vector that represents the entire patch uh, under all possible rotations uh, possible. So let's see what it looks like in practice. So uh, these are actual results obtained with a neural network, um, you know, trained on the data. And so what is happening is, so suppose we have an input patch uh, over here. It's an RGB image. So we use this underline to indicate that this is actually um, a vector valued uh, feature map. Then we can apply our lifting convolution as uh, parameterized by a convolution kernel. So what you see over here is an actual convolution kernel that, that we learned. And the lifting convolution is obtained by taking this convolution kernel and rotating it. And then every time we rotate it, we do, you apply the conf2d operator. We can do this efficiently. Uh, you learn this in the, the, the tutorial uh, later. Uh, but yeah, so we can rotate this kernel, this core kernel to create this filter bank and then stack all the responses that each kernel uh, generates as denoted with these uh, planes over here. And then what you see is that, well, 
under one orientation we pick up a certain pattern and that ends up somewhere along this orientation or rotation axis uh, in these feature maps. And what we then do, we apply our uh, group convolutions to reduce it to, uh, with, without padding on the spatial axis, to reduce it eventually to a single point um, and all possible uh, rotations. And then uh, vertically you see all these different feature values uh, that are uh, remaining. And then if you want to make this pipeline completely rotation invariant, then we do this pooling over this extra uh, rotation axis to come up with a feature vector, a vector of values, um, you know, representing this entire patch. So what we're now going to show is that this is a truly invariant feature vector because if we rotate this, yeah, sorry that I use a different notation here, that, that's the one that we use in the paper. So we use the, the representation of the rotation group on these images to rotate the image that creates this uh, instance, then apply the same lifting convolution, then you see that this pattern is now picked up by the kernel that is rotated by 90 degrees. So we see, even though the image is rotated, the exact same information stays in the neural network. It's just ending up at a different location along this rotation axis. And we can always switch between the two using the regular representation of the group acting on these uh, feature maps. Yeah, and so we continue our group convolutions and in the end reduce it to a single feature vector. And you see, uh, because of this max pooling over theta that we end up with a truly rotation invariant feature vector that we can use to reliably classify these patches as either being healthy or pathological. Okay, and so we did quite some experiments uh, with this. Um, for example, uh, on this mythotic figure uh, detection problem, we computed these F1 scores. And what we did, we compared it to uh, a conventional 2D CNN, which was trained with data augmentation. So that's this uh, uh, result over here. And then we trained our group convolutions trained without uh, rotation data augmentation. And this figure requires some explanation. So N is one here is the amount of rotations that we use to discretize the rotation group. Where N is one means uh, I only rotate it once or essentially I don't, do not rotate it at all. So that boils down to a regular 2D CNN. So no rotations. Okay, and then we use the same architecture, but now we sample, for example, two rotations, so 180 degree rotations uh, and four rotations and eight. So this is the discretization of the group, discretization, <laughs> sorry, the, the discretization of the group. So we match the kernel under eight different rotations and uh, build the group convolutions with it. And another important remark to make here is that all these networks use the same number of parameters. And since here we use a finer discretization, so 16 rotations, for example, that means uh, in our implementation at least, that we need 16 times more uh, weights, for example, for these uh, group convolution uh, kernels. And in order to keep the number of parameters fixed or approximately the same, we reduce the number of channels that are encoded by these uh, group convolutional neural networks. And that actually leads to the effect that if we use a too fine discretization of the group, um, that we're starting to over-parameterize uh, the convolution kernel, right? Because at some point it doesn't make sense to rotate a kernel by just a small amount uh, and then use a different weight for the response of this rotation. Um, yeah, you use way too much a weight for what you can actually detect uh, under such fine uh, rotations. But the main point to be made here is that if we choose an, appro an uh, appropriate discretization of the group, uh, we start to significantly outperform methods that are based on data augmentation. So this shows that we can reach performances that you cannot reach with data augmentation alone. And this has to do with the fact that, uh, well, the network, even though we have less channels, for example, less independent features than in this case, because we wanted to make a fair comparison here, uh, even though we have less independent features, um, these features do not have to learn all these rotated variations. So they can entirely focus on learning the, relative, uh, the relevant uh, patterns and by which they are uh, able to achieve performances that you cannot get with data augmentation alone. And again, these group convolution methods are not trained with rotation uh, augmentation. Okay, um, so a second series of experiments what we did and this type of data is to test indeed how reliable uh, these methods are. So if we have this patch and we have a prediction, we can measure the, uh, the probability for a certain class for every possible rotation. And that's uh, 
visualized in this this sort of a glyph plot um, where blue is uh, or let, let's look at green green is the baseline the 2d cnn and okay what is a clear example yeah maybe this one so it, in some orientation it says it's healthy and another orientation it says it's pathological then another orientation it says it's healthy again healthy healthy pathological healthy so it's a bit unstable for all these rotations and this method was trained with data augmentation and then we look at the proper discretization of group convolutions you see that for all different rotations of the input it keeps the label uh, fixed uh, we also observed on rare occasions some degenerate uh, cases and yeah um, you know, we think this has to do with uh, the discretization so uh, we always have to deal with numerical artifacts and the fact that we want to uh, do capture all possible rotations but we have to pick a certain uh, discretization and in the next lecture lecture two, two we're going to talk about steerable group convolutions where we do not explicitly sample the rotation but really treat this as a continuous rotation group and this solves uh, this uh, problem uh, partially but for now, we can tell that these GCNNs, they can uh, guarantee geometric stability. So, um, well, up to these numerical artifacts. So this, this, that means that they are robust to input distortions and regular CNNs aren't. And finally, uh, we showed in this paper that uh, group convolutions are more sample efficient. For example, with, um, so these are the baseline models uh, trained with rotation augmentation and the colors indicate different levels of uh, available data used for training for red means we used 100 percent of the available data and uh, purple means we only use 10 percent so what we show here is that only with 25 percent so that's the blue curve we already start outperforming uh, the 2d cnn which was trained in red here with with all available data so GCNNs are also more sample efficient and this obviously has to do with the fact that we only have to learn one core representation and then all its rotation, rotated variations are uh, well intrinsically handled uh, by the neural network. Okay, so and since then we've been applying this to different types of applications starting off in the 2D medical image analysis domain, vessel segmentation or other type of segmentation tasks and we see the same uh, behavior that if we increase the resolution along the rotation axis so sort of we turn on the group equivalence aspect of things then we start to quite significantly outperform methods like the 2d uh, conventional methods that are based on uh, data augmentation and then in follow-up work we also try different types of groups for example in computer vision scale equivalence is important and also there we show that with group convolutions we can get to performances that you cannot reach with uh, with data augmentation uh, alone and in this case we even did something like test time uh, augmentation that we pull an image in the different scaled versions through a neural network and and uh, just pick the best result out of it but we never are able to uh, surpass these group convolutional methods so here encircled uh, in green and this notion of group equivalence obviously also translates to other type of uh, domains where symmetries are important. And I think this is a nice example of uh, scale equivalent learning on raw waveforms. For example, if you look at audio and you want to do some sort of speech recognition, then a word can be uh, spoken by me or someone else with a lower voice or a higher voice. So uh, the word should be, uh, the, the perception of the word should be invariant to the pitch, right? So. And pitch shifts uh, are also nicely modeled with, uh, with scaling, with scale or multiplica multiplicative uh, transformation. So um, a frequency with a low pitch has more stretched waveforms than at a high pitch where it's more compressed. So we can also use group convolutions to encode these kind of symmetries to, to sort of learn pitch invariant representation of, of audio. And that's what we do uh, in this paper. But then there's, of course, many other application domains and also many other people working on uh, group convolutions to, you know, uh, to leverage this notion, uh, well, the, the symmetries in your neural networks as much as possible, both in 2D and 3D and, and quite abstract manifolds in general. And all papers uh, come to the same conclusions that um, we need to use the right inductive bias and that is guaranteed equivalence because this ensures that no information is lost under a pitch shift or a translation or a rotation or whatever uh, transformation can be expected 
And that way the group convolutions we get can get performance gains that cannot be obtained with data augmentation alone. And importantly, here is actually also that uh, with data augmentation, what you have is that you have an image, for example, and um, let's say some, some pattern in it, which has some orientation. Then what data augmentation does, you rotate this entire patch. So uh, let's rotate it in this direction. So this arrow comes over there, that one over there. So you only are able to capture these global, um, let's say, rotations or a, a transformation. Whereas with group convolutions, you also automatically handle these local rotations. So we're able to detect this pattern and this pattern. And, you know, um, these features can locally rotate and you would not capture these kind of uh, variations of relative orientations relative to each other uh, with data augmentation, whereas with group convolutions uh, you do. So in a sense, data augmentations are all only enforcing, let's say, global invariances, whereas with group convolutions you can, if you go deeper and deeper in the non-network and you stack these receptive fields, you also obtain global invariance, but at the same time also local invariance. But most importantly is that due to this equivariance, we have increased weight sharing, uh, there's no need for uh, rotation augmentation, and we have increased uh, sample efficiency as we uh, showed uh, just now. Now in the next video, I want to say something about uh, all, all these, these kind of methods, what, what they have been worked on and what people are currently uh, working on.